All right. Daniel Whiteson is a professor and researcher in the field of experimental high-energy high physics. He's interested in probing the structure of matter and the nature of its interactions at the very smallest scales to understand the fundamental nature of our universe. His research uses the LHC to investigate the basic building blocks of the universe around us, hoping to find new kinds of particles or interactions and reveal a deeper and simpler layer underlying our reality. Whiteson's research has appeared widely in popular media outlets, including The New Yorker, Ars Technica, Vice, and many others. Along with his colleagues, he created popular comics, including What's in the Data, The Higgs Boson Explained, and True Tales of Dark Matters, which were all featured on PBS. This is What Does Science Know by Daniel Whiteson. Hello, good evening. How is everybody doing? All right, that's a nice response. So thank you very much for the invitation and thank you to the organizers. It's been a wonderful day of talks. Let's give them a round of applause. Nice work, everybody. Uh, but mostly, thank you to you for coming to this talk. I know it's a beautiful night here in Madison. Well, for Madison, perhaps, it's a beautiful night. Um, and you might be uh, off doing something else, but you came here to hear talk about what does science know? So I'm gonna begin by saying something provocative which is that tonight I want to celebrate ignorance. Not the kind of toxic political ignorance which is threatening to erode intellectualism in our country, but an honest scientific ignorance which embraces what we don't know as the first step to future discovery. All right, let me turn down the gain on this guy a little bit because I think you can hear me quite well. There we go, that's better. Okay, so the title of my talk is what does science know? And I'm going to give away the, t the, the answer immediately by showing you the title of the book that I recently wrote. Okay, the book is called We Have No Idea. And you're a smart audience. You're probably used to hearing talks by experts about their science books. And when you hear a talk by an expert, you want to hear from an authority in the field, right? You hear a talk about evolutionary biology, you want to hear from a biologist, right? You, want to, you hear a talk about the history of whatever, you want to hear from an expert in that field. So if I'm talking to you tonight about what science doesn't know, right, or what we, uh, the ideas we don't have, you might be wondering, well, what's my particular ignorance, uh, my particular expertise, right? Well, it's not that I'm a professor of ignorance or anything like that, but I feel like I do have a special passion for understanding what science hasn't figured out. Because for me, science is more than just a list of facts. It's a method. It's a way that we learn about the world, and it can be used in all sorts of settings once we've mastered it. Now this is work that I've done together with uh, this work together with my partner Jorge Chan. He's a cartoonist, and for those of you who, who know Jorge, you know that he's not just some random online cartoonist. He's like a rock star in academia. Okay, he's written these cartoons called PhD comics, which are read by over seven million people every year, and they describe the frustrations of research and work in academia. And wherever I go to visit physics labs, there's always one of his cartoons up on the wall. And usually it's one that's making fun of professors and you know, uh, touching on that awkward relationship between the graduate students and the professors. So Jorge is a famous online comic. And a few years ago, I had the idea, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to explain physics using cartoons? Because physics can be sometimes an intimidating topic for people who don't know it. Uh, when I travel around, people here, I'm a physicist, they always say, oh, I never liked physics in high school, right? So I thought it might be nice to use cartoons to explain it as sort of a way to reduce that intimidation factor. But I don't have any artistic skills myself, so I thought, well, who can I do? Who can I get to draw the cartoons um, in, in that book, for example? So my wife, who's also an academic, she said, oh, why don't you email Jorge Chom and get him to do the comments, right? And I said, yeah, sure. And then after that, I'll call Brad Pitt and uh, maybe we can do a movie together or something, right? <laughs> so I never heard back from Brad, but I did cold email Jorge and he wrote me back and we got to work on these wonderful projects together. One of our first projects was a video about the Higgs boson and it describes what is the Higgs boson in a way that I thought would actually be accessible and explain uh, what was interesting about it. And that was really fun and it actually went viral and went all over the world and the New York Times and uh, when they awarded the Nobel Prize for the Higgs boson, the Nobel, then when they award the Nobel Prize, they usually have a list of additional reading. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, and on the list of additional reading, they actually point to our cartoon. And I thought, wow, the first time, and probably the only time, the Nobel Prize Committee will point to my work. 
but hey, I'll take it, right? It's an online webcomic, but it is what it is. All right, so we had a lot of fun doing that, and then we wrote this book called We Have No Idea, right? And there are a lot of popular science books out there, and a lot of them explain what science has figured out about the universe, which is a lot, because the universe is awesome, right? But that's not this book. This book instead is about all the things we don't know about the universe. It's about embracing what we haven't yet figured out. Because for me, science is about being an explorer. It's about sailing into the unknown. And when I was a kid, and I was learning about the age of explorers, and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to be the first person to do something or go somewhere? I mean, imagine, what was it like to be the first person to see the Grand Canyon, right? Who was that person? Wow, what an amazing experience or the first person to eat some weird fruit, right? I mean, probably it was gross, but I mean, they got to be the first person to do something. The first person to ever eat chocolate, right? Or the first person to eat chocolate while looking at the Grand Canyon or whatever, right? These are all firsts in human history, and I wanted one. I wanted to be on the cutting edge of humanity, to be the first person to know something or do something. Problem is, there aren't any more continents to discover, right? And almost all the fruits have been tasted. And thanks to Google Earth and satellite technology, we're pretty sure that's used up, right? There isn't another uh, island for you to sail to and name after your chihuahua, right? That really is used up. And in addition, as you learn more about science, you become more and more impressed by what science has accomplished. I mean, look at the technology we have, right? You can fly across an ocean in a little tube, right? You can download all of human knowledge into a little device that fits in your pocket. Even fast food companies are, doing, are making technological progress, right? I don't even know what this thing is, a Cheeto burrito, but they've figured it out, right? So you might be forgiven for thinking, oh, science isn't mostly figured out. Science basically understands the universe, and there's just a few details. I mean, 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, the normal experience of an everyday person was to see lots of things in the universe they didn't understand. What is lightning, right? What causes this? What is that sound, right? These days, hardly anything happens that you don't think you might have some understanding of, or you're confident that somebody knows. So you might be forgiven for thinking science isn't mostly figured out. Well, the point of today's talk is to make exactly the opposite point. I think that we're at the beginning of a new era of exploration, a new age of discovery, when we're gonna learn things about the universe which will blow our minds, things on the scale of the Earth is not the center of the universe, the Earth is not flat, the, the universe is not deterministic. These kinds of discoveries which shape the very foundations of how we look around us. This is what science can tell us, and these are the kind of discoveries that, that are coming. All right, so what am I talking about? Because it's not true that there's another continent for you to discover, right? Instead, I'm talking about really big questions, the really big, fat questions, the kind of questions where you don't need to have a science degree to even understand the question, right? And everybody wants to know the answer. Plus, if you knew the answer, it might change the way you lived your life, right? This is the kind of question that I think is exciting. So what are we talking about? Well, you ask people here or down the hall, um, what's the most important question? They might say things like this. Well, why are we here, right? Or, or what happens after we die? Imagine if you had actual objective knowledge to answer one of these questions, right? Like indisputable knowledge. That might change the way you lived your life, right? That we can certainly agree on. The problem with these questions is that they're sort of philosophy questions. People have been thinking about them a long time. They smoke banana peels and talk about it forever and not necessarily made any progress. I'm actually a member of the philosophy of science department in my university and sometimes I wonder, are they actually interested in answers or just really interested in talking about the question? Which is fine, right? But let me give you an example. Here's a question they talk about. What is it like to be a bat? I didn't make this up, okay? This is the title of the most widely cited philosophy paper ever. Okay? They've been talking about it for decades. They're going to continue talking about it for decades. Spoiler alert, if you haven't read the paper, the answer is we'll never know. Okay? Maybe that's a relief. Anyway, these are philosophy questions. They're important questions. We're not necessarily going to get answers. To me, the exciting thing is that there are other questions, questions at the same level of importance, but these are science questions. Okay? Questions like, what is everything made out of? How did the universe begin? Take that last one. Imagine you had actual factual knowledge of how the universe began, the first moments, right? Because it began in one way and in no other way. If you knew that, that might very well affect the way you live your life, right? That would inform the context of the whole human experience, regardless of what you believe. The amazing thing is, one day we will know. 
because this is a scientific fact. We can pick through the, or the remnants of the Big Bang and figure this out. In a hundred years, in a thousand years, this will be known. And those people will look at us and they will say, what was it like to be so ignorant, right? To not know the answer to this very simple, basic question about your life, right? The way we look back at primitive man and woman and wonder, what was it like to look up at the stars and not know they were stars, right? We are primitive man and woman. And the future will look back at us and not have any conception of what it was like to be us. That's the scale of the questions we have unanswered, okay? So I can't talk about all of them tonight. I'll talk about this one. What is the universe made out of? This is in fact what I devote my professional career to. And I think it's a reasonable question to want to know the answer to, right? What am I made out of? What are you made out of? What is the organizing principle of this whole ridiculous, beautiful universe we find ourselves in? Well, I'm certainly not the first person to ask this question, right? I think people have been asking this question probably since people have been asking questions, you know? All you need to do to be inspired to ask this question is take two rocks, smash it together, you get smaller rocks, right? And then take those and smash them together, you get smaller rocks, and so on and so on. I literally remember doing this as a child and wondering, can you get infinitely small rocks? Or at some point does it stop being rock and turn into something else, right? So maybe it's no surprise I became a particle physicist, but I like to imagine if particle phys physicists were superheroes, this would be our origin story, right? Now imagine you were this caveman or cavewoman physicist, and you were the first person to try to answer this question, what is the universe made out of? What a big question, right? How do you tackle such a big fat question in science? Well, when we don't know how to start, we just do the simplest thing first. If that fails, we'll do the second simplest thing. We'll just keep elaborating until it works. So what's the simplest approach to this problem? What is the universe made out of? Well, you might start just by making a list, right? So say, what's in the universe? So, all right, we're in caveman times, right? So I'm in the universe, you're in the universe, there's a rock over here, a rock over there, right? And there's a lot of problems with this approach, right? Problem number one is, there's a lot of rocks in the universe, right? Um, problem number two is that the universe contains more than just rocks, right? As you look around, you think, if you want to explain what's in the universe, you have to describe the incredible complexity of stuff in the universe. You know, the ice cream, and the mushrooms, and the flowers. And the more you look, the more complexity you discover. I mean, we have bicycles, and puppies, and strangely muscular guys become governor of California. I mean, it's an amazing world we live in, right? And if you're going to answer this question, what is the world made of? What is the universe made out of? You have to explain all of this complexity. Okay, so it's pretty clear the list approach, not the way to go, right? I mean, imagine, if you think about the structure of the kind of answer you want. Imagine if you asked me, Daniel, what is the universe made out of? And I had an answer and I gave you a list, of literally everything in the universe. You wouldn't go, ah, aha, now I understand, right? There's no insight there. That's because this isn't the, uh, the approach of a botanist, right? We want a reductionist approach. We want to peel back a layer of reality and explain all of this complexity in terms of something smaller, something simpler, something underneath, right? That's the kind of answer we want. So how do we get there? Well, we don't just make a list. What we do is we organize our knowledge, right? We sort things, we look for patterns. So for example, we put all the living stuff over here and all the rocks over there, and you know, we can quibble about whether Arnold belongs in the rock category, the living thing category, whatever. Everything falls in a category somewhere. And then you notice patterns, and those patterns lead to questions. And those questions are your clues. They're the things that tell you how to figure out that deeper layer of knowledge, how to peel back the layer of reality and see what's hiding underneath, okay? So let's fast forward a few hundred years, or a few thousand years if you think the Greeks get any credit. Personally, I don't think they should. And, and we're at this point where you can explain everything that you have ever seen, or touched, or tasted, or tripped on, everything any human has ever interacted with, all that stuff can be explained using just a hundred basic building blocks in the periodic table. Wow. Okay, now you might be thinking, this guy's supposed to be a particle physicist. Why is he telling me basic high school chemistry? Well, in my view, the periodic table is one of the most underrated achievements in human intellectual history. Why? Because we start from an infinite complexity, right? And if our goal is to break that down to, you know, one or two particles, getting it down to 100 is most of the way there, right? From infinite to finite is the hardest step. The rest is really just detail. So I think this is undersold. And you have to wonder, why is it even possible, right? Why do we live in a universe 
where almost all the complexity that we see in love arises not from the objects themselves, but from their complexity of their arrangements, right? We live in a universe of a set of simple objects, complexly arranged, that's where complexity arises. Does it remind you of anything? To me, it's like we live in a universe organized by the Lego company, right? This is the basic principle behind your favorite toy, right? With a few basic building blocks, you can make anything. You can make dinosaurs, you can make pirates, you can make dinosaur pirates, whatever you like. All the complexity comes from the arrangements, not from the objects themselves. Why? We have no idea why we live in a universe like that. Personally, I'm glad because it means particle physics is possible, right? I mean, imagine the opposite. Imagine a universe where every kind of thing had its own particle, right? A universe where cats were made out of their own little weird cat particles, and that explains why they're so strange or something, right? We could have lived in that universe. If you're a caveman or cavewoman physicist, you need to consider that possibility also. So I don't know why we live in the LEGO universe, but we do, and I'm glad for it. All right, so we are at the periodic table, right? But we don't, again, just list the elements of the periodic table. We organize them. We look for patterns. After all, it is periodic. So here's a cartoon version of the periodic table, right? And I'm not a chemist, but I know that there are some patterns here, right? There's some things that are active and some things that are inactive, and these guys are metallic, and there are definitely patterns here. And you, of course, know that all these patterns come from the structure of the atom, but imagine if you didn't, okay? And people didn't at some point. You look at this knowledge, you organize the patterns, you ask questions. Why this? Why this? Why the other thing? Those, again, are your clues that lead you to a deeper layer of knowledge. And of course, all those structures you see in the periodic table, all those things that generate questions, those are clues that point you to the structure of the atom, right? Because it's the structure of the atom that determines everything about the periodic table. I don't tell you this because I think you don't know, I'm sure you do, but just to show you that this idea works, right? organize your knowledge and look for patterns, it's the, those are the clues. And we're gonna use that approach when we get to the forefront of human knowledge or staring into the abyss of cosmic ignorance that we find ourselves in. All right, so let's dig a little deeper. Inside the atom, we have the proton and the neutron, right? Make up the nucleus. Turns out the proton and the neutron, not fundamental particles. They're made of smaller particles called quarks. And there's two up quarks, let's see if I can get this later one. Two up quarks and a down, or two down quarks and an up make protons and neutrons, right? So then there's another layer of reality there, where the protons and the neutrons are just different arrangements of little particles inside them. Fascinating, right? But what the even more fascinating thing is what that means. It means that with um, up quarks and down quarks to make your protons and neutrons, scatter in some electrons, you can make any atom, which means you can make anything you've ever seen or tasted, right? Or anything anybody's ever eaten out of just three particles. You ask a particle physicist to write a cookbook, every recipe will have only three ingredients, okay? Up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. The hard part, of course, is in the arrangement of those particles, right? Not in the raw ingredients themselves. It also means, wow, that's great progress, right? Everything you've ever seen can be made out of just three objects. You might be thinking, well, we're going from infinity down to 100, now we're down to just three, I wish you know, I'd be giving this talk in two weeks when we figure out like what the one particle is that rules them all, right? Well, however, uh, that's not the end of the story. And the story gets interesting because there are more than just these three particles. In fact, we have discovered 12 matter particles. So the up quark and the down quark that make up you, for example, are members of the team quarks. So there's also the charm quark, the strange quark, the top quark, and the bottom quark. Not on the committee that named these particles, okay? No responsibility. The electron is an example of particles we call leptons, of which there are also six. What? Why are they these 12 particles, right? So again, we don't make a list. Lists are not informative. We organize our knowledge, and it turns out when we do that, these particles fall into some very interesting patterns. So here we have a new periodic table, this time, it's a periodic table of the fundamental particles, but we're gonna apply the same idea. So let's take a little tour. First, we have the up quark, and the down quark, and the electron. These make up U, right? And in this column, we also include a neutrino. Neutrino is a really weird little particle. Not weird because it's rare. In fact, 100 billion with a B, 100 billion neutrinos pass through your fingernail every second. Yikes, right? Why don't you feel it? 
Why aren't we like all getting cancer from neutrinos or beaten down by the neutrino radiation or something, right? The reason is neutrinos pass right through you without even noticing. They hardly even interact. They can pass through a wall without noticing. They pass through a wall made of lead without noticing. They can pass through a wall made of lead that's a light year thick without noticing. Okay, so neutrinos, really snobby little particles. And there's lots of them everywhere. But that's a clue that the things that are happening in the universe that you cannot see, right? And a lot of them. Okay, so we have this first column. Now the other eight particles we put in, this, in these rows for an important reason. That reason is that the charm quark, for example, turns out to be a copy of the up quark. It has the same spin, it has the same electric charge, it has the same kinematic properties, it has the same interactions. It's just heavier, right? it has more mass. And the top quark is like the, the secret heavy cousin of the up and the charm. It's exactly the same as, as these two, except it's even heavier. It's ridiculously heavy. And all of the other eight particles fall into the same pattern. The strange in the bottom are just copies of the down. The muon and the tau are heavy versions of the electron. There's even three of these neutrinos, though their mass relationship is a little bit more complicated. So now we have these interesting patterns, right? These patterns lead to questions. These are my questions. These are the questions I ask in my research. Question number one. Why do we have all these particles, right? Why 12? Are there only 12? We have no idea. There could be 12. Theoretical physics says there's no limit on the number of particles there could be. So this could be the whole ice cube or just the tip of the iceberg. We don't know. One of the most fascinating questions for me is, why are there three columns? Now, numbers are very important in physics. They have a lot of meaning. For example, uh, one of the stated goals of physics is to explain the whole universe in one equation, right? In a simple equation, one that would like fit onto a t-shirt, okay? That's the goal of physics. Imagine you had that equation, the equation of the universe, right? And you looked at it, and there was a number in it. I don't know, seven, right? What does that mean? It means that the universe itself is somehow seven-ish, right? It's, a, it's deeply seven-y, right? That's powerful meaning. So when you see a number in physics, you have to ask what it means. So I see this number and I wonder, why three? And I go and I went and asked theoretical physicists and mathematicians to say, what numbers do you expect to see in the theory of the universe? And they say, you know, one, two, maybe, pi, probably, e, i, maybe. Nobody says three, okay? Unless they're Catholic, of course, in which case, of course they do, right? And, you know, maybe there's something there. I don't know. So you got to wonder, like, is this a clue? To me, it's very obviously a clue that there's something going on here. Probably the up charm and top quarks are related in some way we don't understand. Like, they're made out of the same little sub quarks, just in different arrangements. And that explains why they're similar, but a little bit different. We don't know. That's just a speculation. But it's obviously a clue because there's a pattern here, right? It's the kind of thing where in a hundred years, somebody's gonna look back and say, they had all the clues. That why didn't they put it together? They were such idiots, right? The way like, you know, that about the discovery of uh, quantum mechanics, right? Einstein, he just he didn't do any experiments. He just read a bunch of papers, put the puzzle pieces together, boom, Nobel Prize, right? That's the situation we're in. I am probably showing you all the information you need to win a Nobel Prize in physics, okay? And it's much harder when you're standing here at the forefront of human ignorance, not having any idea how to solve the problem. Right? In hindsight, it always seems clear. This is what I love about these questions. Another question is, what about the patterns of the masses? We know it increases in this direction, but this one is very, very heavy, and this one is not that heavy. There's no apparent pattern there. We know the Higgs boson is how the particles get mass, but the Higgs boson does not explain at all why some particles get a huge amount of mass and some get almost none. There's no explanation. One of my favorites, though, has to do with the charges of these particles. So the electron, of course, is charged minus one. The quarks have these funny little charges, plus two thirds, minus one third. It seems strange, but if you add up those charges, you get charge plus one for a proton, right? This is a proton right here. And the plus one and the minus one balance perfectly, which is convenient because then you get neutral atoms and chemistry and biology and amazing events and tasty, tasty pizza and all that kind of stuff, right? The problem is, in our theory, the electric charge of the quarks and the electric charge of the, of the leptons are totally unrelated. So imagine you're at the control panel of the universe, right? You can dial up these fundamental constants any way you like and still get a working theory of physics. So is it a coincidence then that these two knobs are set exactly in a way so that, those, so that the particles balance? 
this is not like a 1% coincidence, like, you know, the sun and the moon are within 1% of each other in the sky, which is a total coincidence, it means we get eclipses, cool. This is an exact coincidence, infinite number of decimal places, right? Maybe that's a coincidence, or maybe it's a clue. It's a clue that something is going on here. There's a connection between these particles that we don't understand. Now, we think a lot about these matter particles. We also think about how these particles interact with each other. We have a pretty good working theory of physics. I mean, it's not quite ready for a t-shirt, okay? Here's the equation we call it the Lagrangian of the standard model. And, you know, you try to fit it onto a t-shirt and you might need, like, really, really tiny font. Okay, so we've made a lot of progress in understanding matter, a lot of open questions. But the biggest problem with understanding the question, what is the universe made out of, is that everything we've been studying, all the kind of stuff we've been thinking about for hundreds of years, turns out to be a tiny little sliver of the universe. All the grand generalizations we made about how the universe works and, and what it's filled with, all those are based on only studying the kind of stuff that we see around us. Me and you and hamsters and stars and galaxies and dust and all the stuff we knew about is a tiny slice of the universe. We've recently learned there's less than 5%. And we've measured that number very, very well in several different ways, which puts us at an interesting point in physics, a point I like to call precision ignorance. Okay? We've measured very precisely how much we don't know about the universe. And it's enormous. Now you might be thinking, well, that's disappointing. Right? I thought we'd made great progress. I thought we'd peeled back layers of reality and learned something about the universe. Yes, we have. But it's not disappointing to discover there's more to learn. It's exciting, right? Tell that to the little boy who thought, oh, I wish I could discover a continent. Well, most of the continents have never been looked at, right? Get out in your ship and sail out there and figure this stuff out. So how is it possible? How can we know that we know only a little bit about the universe? Well, let me tell you a little bit about how we figure that out. It started when we were looking at how galaxies spin. So the Earth goes around our star, the star is a member of the Milky Way, the Milky Way is spinning, all galaxies spin, it's totally normal. And when you look at a galaxy, you can measure how fast it's spinning, right? But you might be wondering, like, how is a galaxy different from, like, a merry-go-round? Imagine a merry-go-round with ping-pong balls on it. What happens when you spin a merry-go-round? Well, ping-pong balls are going to fly out everywhere, right? In the case of a galaxy, the reason they don't fly, the stars don't fly out into intergalactic space, is that there's gravity holding the galaxy together. Okay, so that means you can do something really cool. You can measure how fast is the galaxy spinning, and then you can count up all the stars and measure how much gravity there is. And you can ask, is there enough gravity to hold that galaxy together? So they went out and they actually did this. They made this measurement, right? And they discovered that these galaxies are spinning way too fast. There's not nearly enough gravity in these galaxies to hold them together. But the stars are not getting thrown out into intergalactic space. Why not? It's a classic approach in science, right? Take one thing, measure it in two different ways, see if you get the same answer. Usually it's a big yawn, because you get the same answer and you move on, right? Sometimes you don't. You think, that must be something I don't understand, something I'm missing. So to explain this, they said, well, we must need more gravity, but we don't see anything there. So they postulated the existence of something else, something invisible, because we didn't see it, but something that gives gravity, right? And they called it dark matter, right? And this is a classic physics trick something we don't know anything about, give it a cool sounding name to make it sound like we know what we're talking about. But dark matter is the name of the theory. It's also basically all we know about it, right? It's dark. We can't see it. It's matter. It gives gravity, right? So dark matter translates for invisible gravity giving thing, okay? That's what dark matter means. Um, and to think about what, why dark matter is dark, what it means for it to be dark, let's talk for a moment about how particles interact with each other. Because when, when we say dark, we mean that particles don't interact. So there's gravity, of course. Anything that has mass is going to feel gravity, right? Then there's electromagnetism, one of the four forces. Anything that feels electromagnetism will either give off light or reflect light, right? Like you reflect electromagnetic radiation because I can see you, otherwise you wouldn't. And then there's the weak force and the strong force. Uh, which are responsible for holding the nucleus together and breaking it apart. So in the case of, of dark matter, we know it feels gravity because we've just invented it to explain the problem of missing gravity. We know it doesn't feel electromagnetism because we can't see it. It also doesn't feel the weak and the strong force, right? 
which means it's very difficult to interact with dark matter because gravity is super duper weak. It's much weaker than any of the other forces. Okay? So dark matter is very hard to spot unless there's a huge amount of it, like a galaxy-sized blob. And in fact, there's not a little bit of dark matter. If you look at the pie chart of the universe, 5% is the stuff we've been studying for hundreds of years. 27% is dark matter. So if you've been basing your theories of the universe on this tiny little sliver, it turns out most of the universe is something else, right? You don't have to add just like 1% or 2% to the stuff in the galaxy to explain how fast it's spinning. You have to multiply by a factor of 5. Turns out galaxies are mostly dark matter. The stars and the gas and the dust, those are the extra little bits. Right? We've been missing most of the story until recently. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow, right? To say, well, I don't understand how galaxies rotate, so maybe the universe is filled with this invisible kind of matter that we've never seen before, and oh, there's five times as much of it as everything else. That's a big idea. So before people believed it, they had to see dark matter in other ways. One way is through gravitational lensing. Imagine if there's a huge blob of dark matter between you and some other galaxy. Now, dark matter is dark, so light passes through it, but it has matter, so it can act like a lens by bending space. So what happens to a photon that flies out from that galaxy? It gets bent towards your telescope. Another photon in another direction also gets bent towards your telescope. That means if you look at two different places in the sky, you see the same galaxy. Whoa, right? So either you've been hanging out with the philosophers and smoking banana peels a little bit too much, or there's some big blob of stuff out there that's lensing the light. If you Google image search gravitational lensing, you can see some really incredible images. Like this is in the optical, you can really see it. It's amazing stuff. But the best evidence for dark matter really came from a collision. So I'm a particle physicist, which means I like to answer questions by smashing stuff together, right? It's my go-to approach, right? Don't give me your iPhone if it has a problem because I'm just going to take it and smash it in mine, right? So in the, in the case of galaxies, it's a little tricky. I mean, I've asked the National Science Foundation for funding for a galaxy collider, but they haven't given back to me yet. But astrophysicists have a different approach. Instead of building colliders, they just look out in the universe and try to find their experiment already happening, because the universe is huge and full of crazy stuff. So they did that. And they looked at and they found two clusters of galaxies colliding. Now, a cluster of galaxy has normal matter, gas and stars and dust, and also these blobs of dark matter. So what happened when they collided? Well, the normal matter smashed into itself, huge explosions just like you would expect. The dark matter passed right through to the other side. You can see this because it's normal matter. This we can see using gravitational lensing. And the cool thing is the dark matter and the normal matter got separated. Right? They're peeled away from each other. Now, dark matter passed through because it's dark. It doesn't interact with normal matter or with itself. Its gravitational pull is not enough to slow it down here. And that means that we can tell that dark matter is its own thing. It's not just a misunderstanding of the way we think about gravity or galactic rotation curves. It's its own thing with its own gravity. It's its own kind of stuff. That's why we're confident in calling it matter. But what is dark matter, right? We don't know. We don't know what it is. Um, you might think, well, maybe dark matter is a particle, right? Because everything else is made of particles. Maybe. But remember, we're extrapolating from 5% into 27%, so be careful. Imagine you made a similar argument. What if you were a, an elephant scientist? And you're trying to understand the elephant, but you spent 300 years just looking at the tail, okay? And you had a really nice theory of the tail. And somebody walked you around to the front of the elephant and said, maybe you should look at the rest of the elephant before you draw your conclusions. Your first instinct is going to say, well, maybe the rest of the elephant's just made out of tails, right? I don't know. Um, you might think, well, that's a really dumb sounding idea. It's exactly the same idea as saying, maybe dark matter is made out of particles, right? It's just because that's all we know. But we've been, we're generalizing on a little slice of the universe. Personally, I hope dark matter is not made out of particles. I hope it's made out of something else really weird, right? That would totally rock our little minds. That would be amazing. But maybe it's made out of particles. Maybe it's made out of one particle. Maybe two, maybe 12, maybe 50. Maybe they have complicated interactions that we don't know anything about. It could be dark physics, dark chemistry, dark biology, right? There could even be dark people, for all we know. Somewhere, there could be a dark physicist giving a dark talk to a dark audience, right? Saying, we understand 95% of the universe, right? Who knows, right? All right, so 5% of the universe is stuff we know, 27% dark matter, we know it's there, we know there's a lot of it, that's about all we know. 
What about the rest of the universe? Okay, 68%. Well, this is a chunk of the universe we call dark energy. Okay, but dark energy is just science code for we have no clue what's going on here. Okay, and the only relationship between dark matter and dark energy is literally the word dark. Okay, now how do we know about dark energy? Well, dark energy was discovered when people were thinking about the past of the universe and its future. How is it going to end? So to think about the future, you have to know a little bit about the history of the universe. So here's a summary of the universe so far. The universe started with a bang, right? And then stuff happened, galaxies were formed, cats and planets and all that stuff. Here we are. And then people were wondering, well, is there enough stuff in the universe after the Big Bang for the gravity of that stuff to slow everything down, stop it, turn it around, and come back to a big crunch, right? This is one possible fate of the universe that falls back into a big crunch. Um, another possible fate is that there isn't enough stuff in the universe. It slows down gradually, but never actually stops. It just sort of drifts out forever, cooling down to something we call the heat death of the universe. Okay, so sort of drifting out this way. So people went out to measure this, and they looked into using telescopes to measure how fast are things moving away from us now, how fast were they moving away from us a billion years ago and five billion years ago. Okay, and the universe surprised us. It said no to option A, no to option B. It went for secret option C. Okay? And I love when the universe goes for secret option C because that's when we learn the most. The universe says, humans, you have no idea what's going on, right? Turns out that the universe did slow down for a while, but then about five billion years ago, something happened. Something we call dark energy because we don't know anything about it started accelerating the universe outwards. It didn't slow down, it started speeding up, right? And we're talking about clusters and clusters of galaxies here, each with hundreds of billions of stars. These are not small objects. You're gonna accelerate an entire galaxy? It takes a huge amount of energy. That's why it's two thirds of the energy budget of the universe. Okay? It's accelerating these galaxies. But we don't know what it's doing it. We don't know why it's doing it. We don't know how it's doing it. All we know is that it's happening, right? We have no understanding of the mechanism or the reason for why all these galaxies are running away from us so fast. The amazing thing is that this dark energy is creating new space between us and the other galaxies faster than light can go through that space. It's not pushing the galaxies through the space, it's creating new space. Imagine Usain Bolt is running fast, running really quickly towards you, but somebody's laying a track in front of him faster than he's running. He's never going to get to you, right? That's the fate of these galaxies. What that means is that things are getting further and further away and they are disappearing past the edge of our observable universe. Right? These things are getting farther and farther away every single day. So things are disappearing from the night sky. Now we don't know what the future holds for dark energy. Right? It might change its mind and do something else because we have no understanding of what it's doing or why it's doing it. But if it continues, it means the night sky will continue to get darker and darker. And if it manages to even shred the Milky Way, this could be the future, right? Look up at the night sky, see nothing. Now, if we're doing astronomy in 10 billion years, assuming astronomy survives the next three years of this president, if we're doing astronomy in 10 billion years, it'd be pretty difficult, right? How could you learn anything about the universe if you look up into a totally black sky? Now, before you congratulate yourselves on living in the now, Remember, we're 14 billion years into the history of the universe. What used to be in the night sky, which is now lost and gone forever, we have no idea, and we probably never will. All right, so let me summarize for you. Here's a pie chart of the universe in honor of Pi Day, which just passed. Most of the universe is something we only recently, in the last 20 years, only recently figured out we know nothing about. That's a humbling discovery right there. Most of the stuff in the universe is dark matter, right? Something we know very little about. We know it's dark, we know it's matter, okay? The rest is me and you and ice cream and bad puns and physics books, okay? We are the etc. of the universe, right? We have been studying the elephant's tail hundreds of years, right? And probably our theory that the rest of the universe is made out of tails is wrong. What does that mean? It means we're poised for a revolution in physics a revolution in our understanding of the universe, right? That's, it means that in the future, right, has crazy ideas. If you could see a child's astronomy book from the year 3000, 
it would have facts in there which children of that age would just shrug off as obvious, right? Facts that would blow your mind, right? Telling somebody that the Earth is a sphere, or that the Earth is not the center of creation thousands and thousands of years ago would rock their world. They wouldn't believe you, right? But of course, physicists are not just sitting around wondering. We're doing everything we can. We have space telescopes and gravitational wave detectors and particle detectors to try to understand all this stuff. And I really hope that this is a golden age of physics. I hope that having identified the questions, right, we've recently discovered the questions, having identified them, we can actually figure them out. That people will look back in 100 years and say, man, I wish I had been a physicist in 2018 when they were figuring all that cool stuff out, right? That's what I hope for the age of physics today. So we're still pretty clueless about a lot of big questions of the universe. Tonight I've talked about one, what is the universe made out of? But there's a lot of other really simple basic questions that we're only beginning to grapple with. Here's one of my favorites. What is space? Right? You might think, well, that's easy, right? Space is emptiness. Space is the backdrop on which the universe happens. But space can do things that emptiness cannot. For example, space can expand. That's dark energy. Space can bend. That's what gravity is, right? Space can even ripple. That's a gravitational wave. We've seen this, right? This one's a joke, by the way. What it means is that space is a physical, dynamical thing that has properties we can't even imagine, right? It's like we're fish scientists swimming in water for a thousand years and not even paying attention to the water itself, right? Maybe the most important question. Another deep question is this one. What is time? We know that space and time are connected, right? They're very similar. Einstein unified them to us, for us into space-time, but we know they're also different. Like, you can move however you like through space, but time moves forward at one second per second, no matter what. We don't understand that at all. Another question is, how many dimensions are there, right? Are there only dimensions that go out forever, like the ones that we have? Or are there looped dimensions, right? Maybe one, maybe two, right? String theory likes 11 dimensions, or 26 dimensions, depending on which one you ask. It's amazing to me that there are still really big questions out there. And I'm not ashamed to say science doesn't know everything, right? There's certainly big questions remaining. And so I hope I've convinced you that science doesn't know everything, but I think there's another interesting question there, which is not what does science know, but what can science know? Because I think sometimes scientists suggest that science is the only way to gather knowledge. It's a very powerful way to gather knowledge, but it can't answer every question. For example, should I get out of bed this morning? Not a science question, right? No experiment you can do to answer that question, right? What should I do with my life? Not a science question. But science can inform these questions. For example, here's an important question. Why are we here? I don't know. But it might be informed by scientific discoveries like this one. What if science found an intelligent race of beings somewhere else, right? That would be an interesting piece of information to add to your wondering about what should I do with my life and what does it mean that we're alive in here? Or similarly, you know, what happens after we die? Well, science can answer similar questions like, can we upload minds into computers, right? This might be a question we can get the answer to and not too far in the distant future. My point is that answers from science can lead to new questions for philosophy, right? Even this one, you know, can we simulate a mind? If so, maybe we could simulate a bat. All right, so, the point of the book, we have no idea, is to be excited about the ignorance of science. Not because I'm saying science hasn't figured things out, it has, but because I'm trying to say that science has a lot more to learn. Thanks very much. All right, we have a couple minutes for questions. I wonder if you saw the story about this company that will upload your brain, but destroy your brain in the process. But my question is to you is, is if numbers are clues to things, I wonder what you think about the anthropic principle. I think the anthropic principle is a cop out. I think it's a way to avoid asking more questions. Um, I think, yeah. I, mean, I always want to ask more questions. You know, why this, why this, why this? It might be that some things are coincidences, but uh, it doesn't mean we should stop answering questions, asking questions. You use the word particles, but I don't know. Um, 
what are the particles made of? You know, it, it's is, is particles even the right word? Because it makes us think of little round things that you could draw. And what what are, it, energy? What? Well, that's a great that question. A question. <laughs> no, no, you. That is a, an excellent question. Thank you very much for raising that. You're right. When I say particles, I'm imagining, and I drew up on the on the screen here for you, little balls of stuff. Why do we do that? Well, particles, I'll tell you, are not little balls of stuff. The reason we do that is that, as scientists, you know, all we can do is explain the unknown in terms of the known. Right? So what is a photon, for example? Well, maybe it's a particle, so you think of a little ball of stuff. Maybe it's a wave, so you think of a ripple in a pond. That's an attempt to describe something which is totally foreign to us in terms of things that we know. Now, a photon is neither a particle nor a wave. Some people say, oh, it's both. The truth is, it's neither something else, something totally weird and unfamiliar to us, that we can sometimes use our model of a particle to describe and sometimes use our model of a wave to describe. So neither of them is really correct in that sense. Now, you asked an even deeper question. It turns out particles we've, we've, we've uh, learned recently are not the actual building block of stuff in the universe either. Particles, it turns out, are just excited states of what we call quantum fields. So the universe is filled with the fields. For example, there's an electron field. And everywhere there's an electron, it's just an excited, oscillating state of that field. So we discovered the particles are not fundamental. They're made out of these fields. What are those fields made out of? We don't know, right? What's that made out of? We don't know. Uh, one question we talk about at length in this book is, is there a final answer? Can you ever get like a final theory of physics and be done and say, here's the fundamental description of the universe? The answer, of course, is, well, we have no idea. But we have some arguments, like if you know about the arguments about the Planck length, some people argue that there might must be a smallest unit of distance in the universe. It's about 10 to the minus 35 meters. It's not a great argument, it's a very weak argument. But if that's true, that suggests that there must be at some level some final theory that describes physics at that level. But we're about 20 orders of magnitude from probing reality at that level, so we have a long way to go before we answer that question. Thank you for that excellent question. So what's your best guess about what gravity is? What is gravity? Well, I, we have a whole chapter about that. Um, to me, gravity, I think, is it's less likely to be a force. I mean, the one question is like, is gravity a force like the other forces? And electromagnetism and the weak force and the strong force, those are quantum forces, by which I mean we can model them by sending little particles back and forth. Like, how do two electrons push away from each other? They send a photon. A photon is the quantum of EM force. For gravity, we don't know if gravity is also a quantum force. We've tried to make a quantum theory of gravity, it just doesn't work. All right? So maybe gravity is not a quantum force like the other forces. It's not actually a force. It's just the bending of space around matter. Right? That could be. Um, but the problem is, the theory of gravity is bending of space, and the theory of quantum mechanics disagree. They disagree about what happened in the Big Bang, and they disagree about what happens inside a black hole. So one of them is correct, or neither, right? But we can't tell which one without seeing the Big Bang or being inside a black hole, right? So, so far, we don't have the information to tell what gravity is. And I'm not a, an expert in gravity, so I can't speculate. But I like the idea of loop quantum gravity, because it suggests that all of space are these little loops which are tied together, and um, that when you move, you actually jump from ring to ring. It makes some sense to me, but of course, that's not a scientific statement because it's not something we can ever test, but not currently. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your very informative talk, and it reminded me of my days when I was at Argonne National Laboratory at an accelerator. Um, so my question is, I liked your graphic of dark matter, and it brought to mind, it's a question, may not have the answer, but it seemed like they had solitano like properties and down that they could pass through one another pass through other matter and not interact with uh the other matter or themselves maybe there's a phase shift when that happens i don't know but what what are your thoughts on that any research on that thank you so we don't know how dark matter interacts we know it feels gravity 
we don't think it feels the other forces, but there could be another force. It could be a new force we've never discovered um, that allows dark matter to interact with itself or to interact with normal matter at a very, very, very low level, less than, for example, neutrinos interact with us. And we're looking for it. There's a whole set of experiments of like really big tanks of, of xenon underground. Xenon is a very quiet, stable liquid. And they're waiting for one dark matter particle to come through and bounce off a single xenon that it is and give it a little kick. And if they see that, they might convince themselves that they've seen one particle of dark matter. Another way we're looking for dark matter interactions is the way that I'm doing it is at the collider. We're smashing particles together and hoping to make dark matter in the laboratory. Because we could make it, then we could play with it and do cool experiments, and they haven't found any yet, but that's, that's one way to look for it. Um, and another thing is that people have analyzed that collision of clusters, galaxy clusters, and they've discovered that it's, it tells us that dark matter doesn't have a very strong interaction with itself, because otherwise it would have bounced off. But it still leaves room for dark matter to have some self-interaction, some new kind of force. And it's a very active area of research right now, self-interacting dark matter. But we don't have any evidence for it currently. But it's, like, it's an enormous field, thousands of people thinking and working on this kind of stuff. It's, to me, it's one of the most interesting questions in modern physics. That is all the time we have for questions for tonight. I want to thank all of you for coming to the first day of Free Thought Festival. Thank you. <laughs>